Today, Napoleon and I are headed to Spain. I mean, I kind of agree with Napoleon on that. <laughs> and we continue the nepotism. I have questions. <laughs> Hang on, so the British army was inexperienced? Hello, everybody. Roger says, hey. From what I gather from all of your comments, we are headed today into the meat and potatoes of the Napoleonic Wars. I don't know if this is where the Peninsular Wars come in. Is that what Spain is? But a lot of you seem really, really excited to get to this part. Spain hasn't really entered the picture very much at all in any of these videos that I've watched. I think they were mentioned in the Battle of Toulon or the Siege of Toulon, and that's it. Like, I don't remember them really being mentioned since then, so I'm eager to kind of see how they get into this and what happens. Here we go. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or Blockade, designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by chief minister Manuel Godoy, the queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed. And he devised a plan to... I mean, I kind of agree with Napoleon on that. <laughs> Sounds like it's pretty messed up. Literally weak and incompetently governed. And he devised a plan to seize control of the country. Vineyards, after a long agony, your nation was perishing. I have seen your pain and I am bringing you a remedy. Pretty much what all dictators kind of say, right? But I have heard from a lot of you guys that Napoleon kind of stabilized Europe in a lot of ways. So there is some good, I guess, that came from all of this. But I don't know, if I lived in Spain, I don't know if I would rather be ruled by Napoleon or by your queen's lover. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations, and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the Palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. And we continue the nepotism, as we've seen in pretty much every other territory in Europe so far with Napoleon and his brothers, or his family of some sort. Who is enemy of your happiness, Napoleon, Emperor of the French? What is Napoleon's origins? From evil. Spanish pamphlet. That summer, 
as napoleon forced a new, modernising constitution on spain and his brother joseph entered madrid as its new king the spanish reacted with fury the french weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honour they were godless atheists who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, Ooh. was the very Antichrist himself. <laughs> Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya, and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessières at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Bailen was a humiliation for France her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona and Zaragoza. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a War of Independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Bimero. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France, with all their arms and plunder, using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Everywhere I'm absent, they commit nothing but follies. <laughs> Napoleon decided the only way... So the case of, I gotta do everything myself, don't I? I guess. ...to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. Yeah. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, 
Madrid opened its gates to his army. Hmm. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000 strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca after a 300 mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well trained, organised, and led. Hang on, so the British army was inexperienced? That surprises me because I thought that the British were like one of the most formidable armies and most experienced armies out there, especially in 1808. I don't know, you guys explain that one to me. Why, why is he saying that the British army was inexperienced? As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sargoon on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. I am pursuing the English sword to their kidneys. <laughs> okay, well... While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore facing odds. We've got a bit of a winter storm going on here right now, and it is freaking cold outside, like down in the single digits temperature-wise. That's Fahrenheit, so I don't know what that would be in Celsius, but way below freezing, I'll say that. So I can't even imagine, like, I can't stand being outside right now for more than, like, a minute or two, so having to march through that type of stuff for days or weeks on end, I can't even imagine. Odds of more than two to one, immediate blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rearguard which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired. The Baker rifle, the rate of fire is approximately two rounds per minute. The Brown Best musket rate of fire approximately three rounds per minute. But the rifle was more accurate. Is that what he's saying? Fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. Mm -hmm. In one legendary incident during Moore's and retreat at farther. Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris. Rumours of plots, and Austria mobilising once more for war. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him and entrust okay so i have sorry i keep pausing i have questions so how are they getting this news to napoleon and what seems like a pretty timely 
manner, but probably horseback and stuff. Was there like a a line of communication happening where they knew exactly where Napoleon was at all times and knew exactly where to send messages to get them to him? And also, how are the British Navy going to know that more is going to this point? to be evacuated by them because I don't see any ships there. ...immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But yeah, the very how do next they know? day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. So the cavalry are on ships. Interesting. I guess they would have had to transport horses occasionally, but I didn't think about that. Horses on the ships, transporting them. I want to see what that looks like. Salt's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Salt would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now, he hurriedly cancelled that order, ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. These poor British troops, they're like, yes, we're about to be rescued. We get to go into port and actually get out of the cold, get some hot meals, all of that stuff. And then you're like, nope, you guys got to go back and fight. I would have been so frustrated. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then, the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards' Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. Cannonball? Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British Army from the dying moor and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, hmm. but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6pm, dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. 
news that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8pm. Mm. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. Brilliant. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire, but overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea, before surrendering. Hmm. Those people of England will be satisfied. I hope my country will do me justice. The last words of John Moore. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? I mean, why can't it be both? Why does it have to be either or? I mean, both can probably be true, right? I don't know, if I was Britain, I would probably want to get the heck out of there as well, because I don't know, what what's in it for you at that point? I guess trade, but I feel like the British Empire was all over the world, really, and why were you so fixated on Portugal? Like, to me, I don't know, it would be almost worth just trading with the other countries where you can still trade with them and not try to worry so much about... <laughs> invading these other countries in order to free up trade because of Napoleon. I, d I just don't know how worth it it is, obviously. They didn't really get much out of it, but I don't know. Like, I don't know enough about all of this stuff. Maybe I'm just making stupid remarks here, but... Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would return to fight another day. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Yeah. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. So I guess this is just kind of referring to him trying to go into Spain and Portugal and take over things generally, because when he actually went down there himself, it seemed like things kind of got under control more, but I'm not really too clear exactly on what he's saying it went badly, other than his commanders just did not have good control of Spain before he went down there, so I don't know, I think a lot of stuff is being left out of this that I don't quite understand the full picture. Maybe you can fill me in on some of this. Alright, so there we have it, Napoleon has invaded Spain and Portugal at this point. Looks like he's kind of got control of things, but it has been a bit of a disaster in a lot of ways for him as well. Again, the last point of why he's saying that it remains ugly, I'm not really understanding because it looks like he pretty much had good control of Spain when he left. But now things are set up to where he's going to be fighting on two different fronts here. Kind of reminding me a bit of World War II again with Hitler with the Eastern Front and the Western Front. Looks like things are starting to get more difficult for Napoleon and kind of hanging on to power and being able to spread his army across two different fronts. Then he's got also the naval stuff going on, which we're not really learning very much about in this, which I think is kind of unfortunate because I feel like that is probably also important. But anyway, if you guys can answer any of my questions down in the comments I would definitely appreciate it or if you just want to add more to the discussion as always also if you enjoyed this video make sure that you like and subscribe if you are tuned into any of my music videos that I've been doing I did miss my classical music this Sunday I just got so busy over the past few days and just did not have time to record a video for that but I am going to record one and try and have it out for you guys tomorrow so it won't be coming out on Sunday it'll be coming out more midweek but at least we'll 
we'll get it done and we'll try to get back on track for Sunday. And I also think what we're gonna do with the Napoleonic Wars is I am just going to finish out the Epic History TV series. I was gonna try and kind of go back and forth between Kings and Generals a little bit, but I think that's just gonna get too complicated. And so I think what we're gonna do is just stick to Epic History TV, finish this out. And I'm sure that the other areas that I'm missing out on will be filled in at some point down the road. In all of the history that I'm gonna be learning, I'm sure that I'll come across some of this stuff again. Roger and I thank you again for watching. Stay tuned as always, and we will see you next time.